I think relationships are one of the hardest things to pray for because there's so much emotion and soul and confusion. Sean is an author and he's the host of the Supernatural Leadership Podcast. We have Sean Gaby over here from Ottawa. Come on, ministers all over the world. He's an incredible leader. God is the author of our love story. He's already written your love story, but yet you come from a broken home where you saw the opposite of that, right? I think I grew up feeling like relationships are fickle, families are unsafe. I'm probably destined to repeat the same pattern. Michelle almost died 10 years ago. The enemy knew he couldn't get us to divorce, so he attacked my wife's body. And I was almost a single dad. If he could kill off my wife, my kids would grow up in some form of a broken home. If he can't get at one area, but come at another area. The area where you have the most warfare, God has called you to have the greatest testimony of God's goodness. This is what's happened in our culture. They get into unhealthy relationship. They become the Messiah for their relationship. That is not the way that we're called to approach relationship. And then you come out of that relationship broken because you're like, what happened? I saw the best in somebody. Isn't that the Christ thing to do? No, we need to establish it on. Don't live a life where you only invest in your marriage when you're in crisis. That is the most dangerous place to live. Well, Sean, welcome to the podcast, man. I'm so excited that we get to have this conversation. You know, we have known each other for a very long time, haven't we? 18 years. 18 years. 18 years. And we were where? We were in a hot tub with a bunch of people. Yeah. And there's a bunch of leaders that were gathered together. In, in Arizona. In Arizona. Yeah. 18 years ago. Yeah. And I still crazy. remember our conversation. You were talking about, um, you know, what it looks like to understand uh, what supports the gift in life. You were talking about, you know, people glorify the gift. People right. glorify what yeah. they see, the tip of the iceberg. Everyone sees the tip of the iceberg. It's like the gift, but they don't always see what goes beneath the water, how deep right. the iceberg goes beneath the water. And that's the character. That's the integrity, right. the right living that supports the gift. And yeah. we were talking about that. And I remember oh that conversation always stuck with me. Um, and because of some things that I was going through in that season, it stuck with me throughout the wow. years. I've actually used that many times over the years. My, and my. Uh, so that, I, that was the first time yeah. we met. That's crazy. Yeah. I remember you had all the dreadlocks going. Do you remember that? Yeah. And, uh, you know, you're, you're a little wild. You know, people like didn't know who you really were. They were like, and yet you were ministering. And that was back in the day, you know, yeah. that's how you were. And yeah. uh, my gosh. And uh, God's done some incredible things in your life, you know, since then. And just seeing what God's done with you and Michelle, your family, your ministry, your church. And as you've traveled around the world, it's just incredible. So, I think being in the right place at the right time yeah. has the potential to change someone's destiny. Yeah. To, 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 to provoke the, the steps towards destiny, to, to initiate so much that maybe wouldn't be initiated otherwise, being at the right place at the right time. And I think... How we do that is to simply be led by the Spirit when we have an opportunity to realize yeah. that, man, some of these opportunities that God is leading us into has so much more attached to it than we realize. Right. And looking back, so many times I've been in situations like that hot tub, random places at random times, but the right time yeah. and the right place. And our relationships that I still have today, decades later, yeah. that have been a huge part of my journey you know, I still have intact and I wouldn't have, be the man I am today without that. And so yeah. never, never, never forsake or never forget the power of a moment because yeah. it can lead to great momentum in life. And that's, and that's kind of what happened with us too, because when you, when we met each other, yeah. didn't know what the future was going to have, how we'd be connected with one another. And it was like, Hey, there it is. But that wasn't the end of it. No. Because, uh, you know, I, I recall like about a year later, you're at my home. And I remember we were having these conversations. Exactly one year later. Exactly one year, right? Which is crazy. And and you were talking about this girl. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, you had been in some relationships before that weren't so good for you. And you were kind of in this season where you were really just focused on Jesus, you know, building a relationship with him and uh, not thinking about getting a spouse. You knew one day that would happen, but you kind of were kind of were afraid. I don't know. Were you afraid maybe at that point? Of, yeah, of, maybe. I mean, I wasn't wanting it. I wasn't desiring it. You know, I was kind of done. I had some drama, you know, yeah. like probably most people do at some point in their life. Relationally, there's some yeah. drama. Yeah. No one likes drama, you know, drama leads to trauma. Yeah. And trauma <laughs> creates more drama. Uh, trauma yeah. creates more drama. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, I kind of, you know, was just forget it. I don't, I'm not looking for it, which I think is the, I think a good place to be in a lot of ways with God. Um, when we come out of a season, 
um, and, and to refocus ourselves on the right thing. Seek first his kingdom and yeah. everything that we need will be added, yeah. attracted to us. It will follow us. It will chase us down. And so yeah. I just wasn't looking for a relationship. And then a relationship was presented to me. Yeah. You know, I was in the right environment once again at the yeah. right time. And my wife actually, who's now my wife, well, at the time she wasn't my wife, Michelle, she was, uh, she attended one of the prophetic schools that I was teaching at the time. Yeah. And uh, even as a student in my school, I didn't have any connection, didn't have sure. any, yeah. you know, interest or anything. It was after that, but it was, you know, it kind of began there. I got to know her there. That's I right. saw her there. She was almost like God was presenting her to me yeah. in that environment because simply I was being faithful with building what God called and yeah. called me to build. It's like the yeah. the thing, that movie, you know, Kevin Costner, build it and they will come. Right. Yeah. You know, you, you do your thing. You focus on what God's called you to do. You're faithful. You're a steward. And yeah. as you're a steward of what God's put in front of you, God adds and he and brings steward, and, yeah. he, and he invites and he pulls in all the things that are a part of your destiny yeah. and your yeah. future. And I love the way you describe that because on the podcast, we often talk about proximity relationships that you know, when you're building a relationship with God and you're in your field or your assignment, like you described, you're focused there as a man, then God brings your spouse into your proximity. So God's order is he always presents a bride to the husband and he brings her into your proximity and as a result, opens your eyes so you can recognize who she is. So that's God's order really biblically that we see often. And we talk a lot about that. So here I'm hearing your story and you're literally describing a proximity relationship where she came into your life under one way through a school, but later on we find out she becomes your wife. So tell her, walk us through this. How do we go from her just coming into a school and now her becoming your wife? Yeah, I mean, after the school, well, let me just backtrack a little bit. Like I actually met her like high by before the school. Okay. It was very brief. Okay. It was kind of like just random. But when I really met her like officially and she was consistently in a six-week school that I was doing. I always say the school because that's where I really met her. I said hi, you know, met her in a bunch of, at a, at a gathering or something. and But that was it. It wasn't an official sort of connection sure. point. Uh, after the school, I arranged this trip where 10 or 12 of us went to this event in Toronto where I'm from Ottawa. Yeah. And so we went to Toronto and she was one of the people that were on this trip. And on that trip, I had an encounter with God a really wild experience okay. that um, I didn't actually know what it meant. I thought maybe it was a distraction. I thought even maybe it wasn't even God. It was so okay. wild and so distracting because it put Michelle in the forefront of my mind at that point. Okay. Yeah. I started thinking about her and I hadn't before that. And the morning after that encounter, I was sitting in this conference and the guest speaker got up and literally said and described my encounter to my a T, which then became, okay, God, I'm listening. Like yeah. I'm paying attention here. This is a confirmation. So, so how did he describe it? Did he like pull you out and said? No, he, he shared just a story. Sh oh, wow. He, his story from the platform was to a T, my experience. My gosh. He yeah. described my encounter, but that it happened to him. his own story. Oh, happened it happened to him. to him too. The same thing happened, of course, different situation, yeah, yeah. but the same theme, the same story to a T. It was so wild. I had told uh, two of the guys that were in my room where I had the encounter in the hotel the night before I had told them this encounter. I said, don't say this to anybody. I told them this encounter and they were behind me in the chairs listing. And when this guy on the platform got up and said literally my same encounter, my God. I looked back and they were like, because yeah. I just told them my encounter that morning yeah. when I got up, yeah. I had told them my encounter. Here this guy is literally reciting my encounter. So yeah. that was a, a sort of the initiation for me sure. that I'm paying attention. This maybe Michelle is part of my future. Wow. And then it wasn't until, you know, I don't know, maybe a couple of months we started to kind of hang out a little bit, became friends with interest. Then she moved to Africa for three months and kind of put, we put each other on the metaphorical altar yeah. and said, if this is God, it will come back. Like we'll lay it down. And if this is a God thing, not just a good thing. I want the God thing. It will come back. And uh, she came back from Africa three months later. It was January of 2007. Yeah. And uh, I, you know, we, we had a week together and then I was flying out to Lethbridge, Alberta, where you were living. Yeah. And I was going on to your TV show at the time. And uh, I left. She drove me to the airport. I went to Lethbridge, Alberta, and I sat in the living room with you in your Lethbridge, Alberta house. And I remember oh 
just yeah. process. I say, hey, there's this girl. I'm thinking about her. I'm like, I, you know, I had this experience, this encounter. I might have even told you. I probably told yep. you the encounter. Yep. You probably don't remember. Um, but I was processing this experience and and is this, you know, and part of the reason why, I don't even know. I mean, I didn't know you that well. I mean, we had, I've known you for like a year yeah. in that time yeah. frame. But yeah. I remember feeling like, man, it was just like everything just kind of came together, Whoa. like just boom, 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 just came together. And I saw clear, like, this is my wife. My and wife. I left the conversation. I said to you guys, listen, I need to go call her. I'm going to go call her. So I went into your, your guest room and, and um, called her on the home phone. And uh, I said, listen, so much just happened to me that I'm confident to say you are my wife. And as I said that, I didn't know, but I called her while she was having a conversation with her roommate, saying to her roommate, oh my gosh, I got to get out of this relationship. Yeah. I had said to God that I only want to, you know, the next person I'm with, I want to get married. I don't want to date. I don't want to figure it out. It's got to be marriage. Well front, yeah. yeah, they were in that conversation. So she was going to like break it off yeah. because I left not, you know, we weren't confident that we were going to yeah. get married. We were just like, hey, maybe we should date. And I call her, interrupt that conversation. And I say literally what she just said to her. My roommate. God. Yeah. I said, I'm confident to say that you're my wife. And so that was like a confirmation to yeah. her. And uh, from that point on, eight months later, we got married. My, my, my. Talk but it all happened that. in your living room. Wow. The power of a living room. <laughs> eh? That's a pretty big statement to make. <laughs> just call her up and say that. Yeah. And now you got 17 years of evidence to prove yeah. that was definitely worthy of that call. You know, that was amazing. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. So, so tell me, what would you say to somebody that's out there right now that's, that is single, uh, that is looking and desiring one day to be married and have a spouse? Because maybe they've been in that waiting season, you know, where they're walking with God in that journey. Um, what would you say to them right now about that? I would say that when you, with everything in you, make God your first priority, make his mission your first priority, yeah. Make every moment a moment that you steward to honor God. God will bring you the desires of your heart, yeah. especially in this area. I think relationships are one of the hardest things to pray for mm -hmm. because there's so much emotion involved. There's sure. so much soul involved. There's so much often confusion sure. involved. People yeah. get confused be, between what kind of attraction this is. Is this a you know, a godly attraction? Is this a fleshly type yeah. of attraction? What is it? And, you know, where do I lean? You know, and it can be so confusing relationships. Like, unlike yeah. any other thing, I think, I, I, I believe this to be true. And this is an opinion. I can't say it's doctrine. I believe one of the hardest things to recognize God's voice in is in the area of yeah. relationship. And, and I would agree with you, Sean. Simply because of the level of emotion that can be involved mm. and our soul. Yeah. And sometimes we don't even know on a conscious level yeah. what it is that we really desire. And it's so important to have God in the journey because he actually knows what we want, but he also knows what we need. And we always talk about here that the more you become the authentic version of who you are, the true authentic self in Christ, the more you become that person, you actually attract the right person. Mm -hmm. And you also start to become aware of not only who you are, but what you need. So in the journey, I think it's still difficult, like you said. It's still difficult. But that makes it a little bit better, you know? And even in that process, you're right, because emotions are evolved. You know, David said, I think it's Psalm 13, he said, you know, how long will I take counsel for my own soul mm. and let my enemies triumph over me? So oftentimes, wow. it's our own counsel uh, that we think we're really smart about, yep. you know, that can get us into trouble. Mm -hmm. And and that's why it's so important to, you know, we always talk about having a time where you separate, like you did. Like you were kind of walking in God's grid, so to speak, mm -hmm. perhaps without even knowing it, by just saying, hey God, I'm tired of whatever I had before in relationship wise. I'm just going to focus on you. I'm going to seek you. I'm going to stay in my field. And, you know, Proverbs 18, 22 says this. It says, you know, he that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains the favor of the Lord. And that word find, we always talk about in Hebrew, actually says that he that recognizes the one that God presents to him will suddenly hmm. recognize who she is. That's wow. the one that obtains a good thing. So that's what happened to you, really. I mean, as yeah. I hear your story, yeah. I'm hearing a scriptural pattern here where God brings somebody into your proximity, and she was a proximity relationship. It didn't start out with a dating relationship or getting to know us, know each other for, for marriage or a potential partner. What, what happens here is, from that proximity relationship, God begins to deal with your heart, begins to deal with her as well. And through a process, 
now this thing gears suddenly shift mm -hmm. and the relationship shifts from that into a potential suitor uh, for you to be married yeah. to, you know? So, yeah, I mean, I, I think oftentimes when we're not looking for something, yeah, um, that something comes. Sometimes I feel like we can so idolize the thing we're asking for that we wrestle to find it. But sometimes when we, we just stop and like, you know, like his word says in Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom. Yeah. And everything that's needed for your journey will be added unto you. And I feel like often that's that's how kingdom life works. Now, not to negate, keep on seeking, keep on asking, keep on knocking, and and pray and bring your requests to God. But sometimes I think, and especially in relationship, we can so idolize yeah. having a relationship uh, and, and almost forfeit the most important relationships. I think that was the journey of Abraham walking up the mountain yeah. with Isaac. Wow. Uh, Abraham, are you, you know, you, you, you believed, you believed, you believed, you, you did something in your, your own way, didn't work out the way you, you wanted yeah. to. You finally got your promised child. You finally got the Isaac. Yeah. And now I'm asking you to give it up. And I think the test was, as he was going up the mountain, probably in his mind, Abraham, like, I want to make sure that if you're going to be, if you're going to fulfill this promise that I've promised you, that you, you would be a father of nations, that you would have descendants that are more numerous than the stars that you can count in the sky. If your bloodline is going to go where I want it to go, I got to make sure that you've not idolized the promise wow. and that you've still, you still worship the one who Give gives them. the promise. Yeah. And I think that there was probably that wrestle going on as he's walking up, as if I'm having to give up the very thing I've been waiting for. But I just believe that this is the test. Like, do you trust the one who gives the promise yeah. or do you put more faith in the promise? Yeah. And I think, so this happens often with, I think, relationships. So, but there, there is this line still between waiting for God to bring, build it and they will come, focus on what God's called you to do, build, 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 and God will bring what you need. And then still pray and not give up on the things that he's promised yeah. you without idolizing those yeah. things. That's right. Um, because I think, you know, I say this all the time, if you idolize a platform, you'll be taken out by the platform. Whatever That's you right. idolize in life right. we'll, take will you eventually out. take you out. Yeah. You know, I'll say to take out your yeah. legs. And so yeah. I, 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 for me, I think, you know, although I wanted a wife, I, I knew I was going to get married. Yeah. And I grew up in a broken home. So I'm like, you know, when I get a wife, I got to know that I know that I know this is the one. Yeah. I don't want to end up like my parents did. Yeah. Um, and so for me, I needed an encounter. But even after I had an encounter, I needed counsel. Yes. I needed to process. I needed guys like you in my corner, guys that I had, the other people that I had in my life at the time, friends, community. Yeah. I didn't just make a decision based upon an encounter. I right. took that encounter and I brought it to the filter of counsel wow. in my yeah. life. Yeah. And both and helped me make a wise decision. Yeah. I love what you said there, Sean. That there, you're right. You, not only do we have encounters, but we need to come to people that we can trust, safe places, yeah, and process together, mm -hmm. right? Because especially in the area of relationship, because that's a big decision. It's going to change your life one way or the other, for good or for bad. Right. Let, let, let's be real about it. And and so I love the way you define the dynamic tension between God. This is my desire. How do I pray for it? But in the prayer, I don't get to the point where I get so obsessed that I begin to idolize the promise. Right. Because ultimately, then the promise can keep you from the God who gave it to you. Right. Right? And that's what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, and Solomon said it in Ecclesiastes. He said, I, think, I believe it's Ecclesiastes 3. He says, out of the many anxieties of life, we dream. Okay. And this is often where people get messed up too. They'll have like a dream about their future spouse. But they were already thinking about this woman or thinking about yeah, this man. wow. And they start dreaming about this man, this, dreaming about this woman. They assume that because their dreams are consistently about an individual, this must be their wife yeah. or their husband. And I think often this is why it's so confusing is because we can get so focused and fixated on things that it affects our dream life. We can become yeah. anxious about things. We can become stressed about things, hyper-focused wow. on things that then enters our dream life. Now, those dreams still speak to us something. They tell us, hey, you know, maybe we're dealing with some anxiety, fear, uh, we're yeah. focusing on the wrong thing. You know, if you play a video game all day long, yeah. there's a high chance you're going to dream about the video sure game that night. Yeah. Whatever you're constantly focusing, yeah. meditating on will affect your dream that's life. Right. And so that's where people get confused too. They yeah. can't decipher, well, is this God? Is this not God? Yeah. And, and of course, you believe that not every dream is automatically from God. Right. right. And so it can be your soul. It could be yep. your emotions. It could be other influences as well.
Yeah. Right? That can occur. You can have spiritual warfare in a dream sometimes, or the enemy can kind of get in there too. Yeah. So depends who you're associating with, who you're connecting with. All kinds of dynamics can play into that. We serve an amazing and awesome God. And just like, you know, I say this all the time, that God is the author of our love story. He's already written your love story. Mm. You just got to become the authentic version of yourself to walk into the place where you experience the story. So God's already authored it. And that's kind of what happened with you and Michelle. There was something going on. There was a connection there. You're trying to figure it out. But I love what you said about the spirit of wisdom, you know. Wisdom is so key in life. Wisdom comes in and helps us see things we can't see because wisdom's analyzed the past, the present, and all angles of the future mm, and then speaks to us in the present and says, I've gone ahead of you and I've seen everything. Yeah. And wisdom says, do this. Yeah. See, when we have a revelation of something, it's not attached to time. Yeah. You know, it's just, you can't tell if it's the future, the past, or the present. But re- what wisdom considers the timeline, it considers all the angles of the future And then when wisdom speaks into our life in a moment, there's always clarity. That's why you had that certainty in your heart. You know how you just kind of knew enough to get up and call her. Think about it. You picked up the phone and said, I got to call her now. And to be that confident and say that to her at the right time when she was in a moment. I mean, that's amazing. I think we need wisdom for a relation. I think like wisdom is probably the greatest thing you can pursue. I mean, wisdom is like an architectural blueprint. Proverbs 8 says that wisdom was the architect with God before the creation wow. of the cosmos. Yeah. Was with God. Like wisdom is the beginning of everything. Yeah. From reverence of the, uh, from a fear of the Lord is the beginning yeah. of, like be, wisdom starts from having a right reverence yeah. towards God. And wisdom is the principal thing. You know, yeah. wisdom is the first gift mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Yes. Wisdom is the first thing in the spirit of wisdom and revelation yeah. that Paul prays yeah, for in Ephesians, Ephesians yeah. 1. Yeah. You know, wisdom is the first spirit mentioned in Isaiah 11 about My the gosh. sevenfold spirit. I mean, wisdom is the principal thing, the starting point for everything we build. And I think that in those moments, those conversations, that's why there's wisdom in yeah. the counsel of many. Yeah. If you want to go to war, if you're going to build something, if you're going to yeah. advance in something, the first and most important thing you need My is wisdom. wisdom. It's the architectural plan, which is like point A to B. Yeah. It's the whole drawing. It's the oh. whole building, right? So how do I how do I get there? Well, I need wisdom. Yeah. And uh, in those moments, it's so yeah. powerful. I, I love what comes. you're saying, you know, for our audience out there, you know, just an encouragement. James says something very much that's very similar. He goes, hey, listen, if anyone lacks wisdom, Mm. Come to God and ask him for wisdom and he'll never find fault with you asking that because he's the true source of wisdom. So he'll never fault us for asking for wisdom. In fact, that's one of the best prayers we could pray. Hey God, I'm asking you right now, would you grant me wisdom right now? Mm. And just ask in faith and you can have faith because wisdom comes, he's the true source of wisdom. And that's one prayer you can always pray and say, God, give me wisdom right now in this situation, wisdom with this relationship, wisdom with this problem. And even as you begin to seek out, you know, if you don't have a partner, you don't have a spouse and you desire that and that's part of your life, then guess what? Ask God for wisdom. I love what you're saying there because wisdom was key in that conversation you're saying. Yep. And, and here we are 17 years later from that time, uh, seeing your life journey play out. Mm-hmm. And I just love the way that you that you brought that up. So that's a major key, I think, for relationships that we want to pick up on in every area of life. Absolutely. Not just relationship, right? Yeah. That we want to build our life on that architectural drawing. I love the way you said yep. that. The blueprints that God's given us to, to begin to walk into the reality of what, what wisdom can actually show us. Right. I think the the what often comes in place of wisdom is compassion. Jesus wow. built a life on wisdom and was moved with compassion. He did not build a life on compassion and wow. sometimes operate in wisdom. This is what's happened in our culture. We've let compassion lead. When we let compassion lead, we wow. compromise truth. Wisdom leads. I always say it like this. Wisdom builds the house. Compassion fills the rooms. Love it. If it's reverted, we compromise truth. And so, you know, I think so many people, that's why they get into um, unhealthy relationships. They let their compassion lead them. They become the Messiah wow. for their relationship. My I gosh. have to save this person. Wow. I have to. I have to be with this person because they need me to help yeah. them. They need me to save them. That's a compassion-led relationship. My gosh. That will not last, and it'll be destructive. But My when you gosh. move in wisdom, wow. and then you fill wisdom with compassion, you will build healthy and long long term. And so yeah. I think so many people miss it because they let the compassion. They feel bad for this person, you know. And they, yeah. Maybe they're like, a, the, the relationship is, a, is sort of like missional to them. Right. They have a mission to help right. this person, yeah. to save this person yeah. from their wretched self. That is yeah. not 
the way that we're called to approach relationship. Yeah. We're called to approach from wisdom and throw compassion That's, in That the is so good, Sean, because oftentimes people get into the same pattern of bad relationships because yeah. they're empathetic, they're compassionate, uh, they want to be the savior, they want to help somebody. And sometimes there's a genuine calling or assignment in their life where they're going to help people. Yeah. But that's your ministry. That's your assignment. You don't want to marry uh, someone that's going to be your ministry. <laughs> you want a helpmate and a life partner that right. can join together with you in your assignment. You yeah. see what I'm saying? Absolutely. So you might be a compassionate person. You might be empathetic. You might be somebody that has that type of assignment in life where you see areas where you're going to meet people's needs. Mm -hmm. But then when you approach a relationship, you approach the relationship with that same compassion. And that's what I love what you're saying. That's going to make it go wrong yeah. in all the kinds of ways you can imagine. And then you come out of that relationship broken because you're like, what happened? Mm. It was filled with compassion. It was filled with love. And I saw the best in somebody. Isn't that the Christ thing to do? Isn't that the right thing to do? No, we need to establish it on wisdom because wisdom gives you parameters. Yes. You know, wisdom gives you the, you know, the house, so to speak. Yeah. Now you know how to furnish it with love, so to speak. And you need knowledge. You need understanding. You need all those things to build really a home. Mm. And so I love what you're saying. I know this is really helping people right now. That tip mm. alone can help people in their journey of life, mm. not just in relationships and even in their relationship today. Mm. If they're in one, if they make this the principal thing of their relationship and they just get together in the morning and say, honey, I'm just going to get, let's just read the word together for a few moments. Let's pray together a little bit. And let's ask God for wisdom in our decision making, in our everyday life. And I'm telling you, Sean, that's going to order their life. Yes, That's going to order their steps right. And, and they're going to experience some great things in life. There's, so I love that key alone. You know, you and Michelle, you're, you're, you've got a great relationship, but you're also great parents. And you're raising your kids well. Right, that's 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 so commendable. But yet, you come from a broken home where you saw the opposite of that, right? And so, talk to us a little bit about your experience being brought up in a broken home. What was that like, and what happened to you, uh, in, in just in a quick way that really changed everything? Yeah, I was five. Yeah. My parents divorced, and of course, like I have, I don't have memory of. It's amazing how a negative thing can cancel out so many positives. Yeah, it's like I, there's a study that's been done about. I think it's like. You know, for every 20, I can't remember what the, the number, but it's pretty big. For every 20 positive things, it takes one negative, uh, wow. you know, word to cancel, to cancel out those 20. My gosh. But I think that it's kind of like that in life, right? It's, it's like you, you can have so much good in life in a relationship or memories, and then one bad memory can kind of cancel yeah. out everything. And that's kind of what I feel like I don't have every, any really any good memory as a child of my parents in marriage. <clears throat> And especially in the divorce is so messy. I mean, I don't know any sure. divorce that's like, doesn't have some sort of casualty, sure. yeah. some sort of, you know, residual effect, some sort of mess involved. But the divorce that I, I was a part of, you know, and no dishonor to my parents uh, was, was quite messy. And the memories that I do have yeah. far outweighed anything ever good. Um, my sister was a little older. And so she had a different experience than I did. But I still remember the day. I remember where I was sitting. I remember what room it was in. I remember the sun shining in to wow. my, my right side and being, sit, being surprised by this, oh, we're, we're getting a, a separation. And then I remember there was lots of drama, lots yeah. of drama after that that <clears> took place. <throat> um, but, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it made me grow up feeling like family probably wasn't safe. Yeah. That at any moment something could break down, something could yeah. implode. Because there was no forewarning. It wasn't like That's I right. saw. I mean, there were things that I saw that I do have memory of, but very few. I mean, I was so young um, at the time. But I, I think I grew up feeling like relationships are fickle. Yeah. Families are unsafe. Wow. And, and I'm probably destined to repeat the same pattern. Because, you know, I, man, I have a great mom. Um, my mom's a, she, she raised, raised me. Yeah. You know, I've, my dad and I have had reconciliation in a lot of ways. And, but I mean, he wasn't sure, around, sure. Yeah. you know? And so I grew up with lots of bitterness, lots of heart issues in that area. In fact, a lot of the reason why I went down a bad road, uh, you know, drugs and stuff was, was because just where my heart was towards this yeah. whole thing. And uh, so I think when I got into, I've had many different relationships over the years, even before I was a, a Christian, many different relationships. And then a few after I became a Christian, I wrestled to say like, I, I God, you have to make this like, like I, the one that I'm called to marry, you have to make it clear. Yeah. Like I shared that, that story. Yeah. But I think growing up, like I said, growing up in a divorced 
home oh, just makes yeah. you more sensitive to these things. And I give sure. credit to my wife. My my wife is is such an amazing mother. It's, yeah. it's not, not everybody has it. Like I, not, I think everybody can be a mother, but some people just have this amazing yeah, ability to mother so well. And she's that. She just okay. has this amazing ability to mother so well. I've learned so much from her, even her family culture, because she didn't grow up in a broken home. Oh, okay, yeah. But I've learned so much from her own family culture um, over the years of just what it looks yeah. like. To, so that was nice for you yeah. to see that modeled yeah. for you in a Absolutely. sense. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, coming back to your, your story, so here you are from this broken home, drugs, craziness going on in your life, pain that you're walking through, trying to figure it out. I love the way you said you always thought that you wouldn't be able, you're going to repeat it. Yeah. But yet you're probably afraid that you never want to repeat that. With all your heart, you don't want that, but you don't know any other way. And so in the process, you go through a little bit of a change. So like what happened to you that first changed your heart to begin with? Like what happened to get you out of the pit you were in, so to speak? Well, I think I think one element of who I am that's pretty, I think a good attribute is I'm a perseverant individual. Okay. I can persevere through so much naturally. I'm a high-driven person, high, highly motivated individual. So I have that going for me, and I think that's a good thing. I think in our culture today, people give up when things get hard. People yeah. quit. Relationships are hard, man. They're, yeah. like, they're messy. And I, I would I would be lying to say that I'm not still vulnerably susceptible to the temptation yeah. of the potential of repeating what my parents did. Of course, yeah. I'm in a different space in life, yeah. but I'd be lying to say the enemy doesn't try to come in and sure. say, you know, you're going to screw it all up or something bad's going to happen. Like there's moments, like as Paul said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have to put on our new nature every day. Yeah. We have to put on yeah. Ephesians 6, like our fighting armor every yeah. day. We have to remind ourselves of who we are. Yeah. You know, the moment we forget who we are, this is the moment we start accepting the lies yeah, that the enemy who, drops into our head. That's right. Right? Because he also says, put off the old man. Yeah. And that doesn't just mean the person we used to be or the fallen nature, our human nature, in other words, uh, but he's also putting off the trauma. Yeah. Putting off the negative experiences that are forming a framework uh, from which we project into this world. Right. And we project on others or in our relationships. And so part of it, that is exactly what you're saying. You got to put off the old man before you can put on the new man, the new nature, the recently born man, in other words, yeah. the new creature you've become in Christ, you got to put that person on, which is the true version of yourself. Yeah. And when you do, you start to see things differently. You perceive maybe through a lens of love. You perceive with understanding. You perceive with grace into the moment. And you don't perceive with judgment, perhaps, you know, yeah. or critical attitude. Because when you have human nature, I mean, it's just dark. Human nature is dark. And we look at things in a very dark way. But when we address our human nature through the cross of Christ, meaning he took on himself our human nature, our old nature, our Adamic nature, our fallen nature, there's many ways we can say it. And then that's how we put it off. You say, listen, Jesus, I was crucified with Christ. Not only was Jesus crucified, but I was, the old me, the old nature was. And we got to keep bringing that nature there and keeping it there and keeping dead and buried. Yeah. And in its place, we got to live out of this new nature, which is a you know life flowing on the inside of us. But you're right; you got to do it every day. Yeah, and the core, I think, the core of all that to add to that is, you know, I think the only way we succeed as believers is to keep remembering at the forefront of everything we do, remembering who He is, remembering who we are. I mean, that's that was the oh. last thing that Jesus instituted before he went to the cross, was he sat with a bunch of his team at a supper and yeah. he said, do this in remembrance of me. me. Remembering, yeah. that word remembrance actually in the Greek literally means to bring me back to the forefront of your focus. When we put wow. him in the back seat, that's when we forfeit and that's when we begin to act as orphans again. Wow. But if we keep him in the forefront, I always tell my kids like, you know, what does remembering mean? I've taught them to think this way. It's to put Jesus in the front seat yeah. because nice. maybe he's been in the back seat. You know, and in relationships, often this is where he takes a yeah. back seat. The relation takes takes first place in our wow. life, but he is the only relationship above all relationships that that should be yeah. be in the front seat that should matter the most. Because at the end of the day, even my kid, my seven year old, uh, <clears throat> she'll ask me the question, "Who do you love more, me or Jesus?" Oh wow! She'll ask me that question, yeah. and I'll say, "Jesus." She says, "Good." So do I. She's seven. Wow, that's she great. has an understanding of what it looks like to keep Jesus in the front seat because. I've taught my kids to understand this is, this is what remembering is. When we don't remember and we forget yeah. who we are and whose we are 
Yeah. It's like putting Jesus in the back seat. Yeah. Drive, driving the vehicle along, driving the vehicle without him telling us where to go. That's what we don't want to do. And I think that happens uh, in these areas. It happens, you know, that's, I think if I'm tempted to say like, I'm going to repeat this pattern, I'm going to end up breaking down my family and my family is going to implode. That could all be a lie. Yeah. But there's still that temptation that might come and I have to say, okay, okay God, like, no, I'm putting you in the front seat in this area. Yeah. You're going to keep me in the right, on the right path. You're going to keep this thing intact. You are our leader as yeah. the family unit. You are the yeah. leader and you're going to keep us moving forward. And we will not repeat. In fact, we're breaking that, curse. that susceptibility That's that right. we are connected to from our past. We're breaking yeah. it by every day remembering yeah. that you've promised good things for us. It was so, abundant life for so us. So you have to really be intentional. Is what Absolutely. You're saying. And you're saying intentional on a daily basis. Yes. Uh, and that's the only way to deal with some of those uh, ways that the enemy would like to, or the curse would like to find place in your relationship, really, and get into your family. Because yeah. you don't want this thing to be repetitive. So today, here what's interesting is, your children are not thinking like you have to think. Because they're being modeled, they're seeing a model of a healthy relationship with mom and dad. And they see a couple that loves one another. And so they're, they're not having this fear in them, right? They're learning about Jesus at a young age. You know, when you were five, you were struggling. You know, and here they are, you're a seven-year-old saying, hey, and you know what? God, I love Jesus more than you, dad. Yeah. And, and knowing that that's acceptable to you, yeah. that dad's okay with that. He approves of that. He, he loves that about me. Mm. You know, isn't, that's a great yeah. uh, way for a child to grow up. You know, we, we, we didn't, almost divorce 10 years ago, but Michelle almost died 10 years ago. Yeah. And just thinking wow. about this that. Yeah. out loud, I'm like, you know, the enemy knew he couldn't get us to divorce. So he attacked my wife's body to the place where she almost died yeah. 10 years ago, this year, 10 years ago. My gosh. And I was almost a single dad. Yeah. So I'm just thinking about like the, the, the attack of the enemy. If he can't get at one area, he'll come at another area. Yeah. So if he can't attack the emotional bond, the spiritual bond, he might attack the physical. Yeah. He might attack in another area. He might yeah. go after something. Because, man, man, if he could kill off my wife, my yeah. kids would grow up in some wow. form of a broken home. That's right. And so you, you see this, like, this warfare. I think sometimes the most, the area where you have often the most warfare is the area where God has called you to have the greatest testimony of God's goodness. My. So pay attention to that because he'll try to come in and he'll, 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 he'll twist things. He'll come at you in different areas. And if you're not ready, I mean, we know the enemy's prowling sure. around like yeah. a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I mean, That's he's right. trying to find something in That's someone right. to devour. And so we yeah. need to pay attention and be on guard and, and keep, you know, it's like why he instituted the Last Supper. Like, you know, be thankful in the midst of all seasons and remember that he both died and resurrected to set us yeah. free from yeah. everything that would hold us down. Yeah. And, and just coming back to that, I know you brought that up. I know it's very sensitive, but I remember those days yeah. being on the phone and praying with you guys and praying as well after when you're telling me what the process of what was going on. And But man, you guys came out of that. You guys came through that. So how did you do that? If I may ask. I know yeah. it's not something where you're like, no, may as well, you went there. Crazy. I, I'd say it was a combination of so much. I mean, from like, you know, God and, and his voice. Yeah. Thank God that God speaks because these words that come to comfort and to, to, to give confirmation as to yeah. outcomes and what's going to happen. That's number one, counsel, having community, great community, great people in my life, leaders, people from around the world praying. Yeah. All of these things kind of culminate to uh, some form of strength in seasons of crisis. Mm -hmm. Crisis has a way of really pulling out what's already inside. You know, it's yeah. like the, I always say this to yeah. our church, like the pandemic didn't make anybody crazy. It just magnified the crazy that was already there all the time. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you don't, you don't add sure. oil into an olive. Yeah. The oil was always there. It only comes out when you crush it. So yeah. crushing and crisis has a way of drawing out what's already on the inside. And so, you know, in these moments, I saw what was inside my community. Yeah. I saw what was inside my life. I saw what was inside the people I love around me, my mentors, my the leaders in my life. Their love for me came to the forefront. And that was a strength in that yeah. season. I remember being in a stairwell, you know, when my wife was about to be taken into a seven hour surgery, she was ranked second, uh, 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 second highest level emergency in one of the most wow. high risk hospitals in my city next to a guy whose insides exploded. And um, I was, she was being rushed in. And I remember weeping in the stairwell, called one of my finance guys and 
one of my pa my associate pastors at the time and just weeping and just in wow. praying. But then leaving moments like that, feeling like, man, I have joy. I can't explain it. It's like a yeah. joy unspeakable. I can't, I can't explain yeah. it. And then moving into a place of just being able to praise God, like I already had the victory. Yeah. Moments like wow. these, you wow. know, which happened multiple times along this journey, kind of set me up to have a faith and a strength to believe that we would come out on the other side. Not yeah. only did we come out on the other side, we came out even stronger. Yeah. Well, which amazing. is the promise of God. Like, yeah. you know, it's like Job. Not only will you get what you got lost, you'll get yeah. double. Yeah. Like double for all your yeah. trouble. It's like, that's the yeah. goodness of God. He redeems yeah. you, but not just giving you back what you right. lost, giving you even more. Yeah. And, and, but I love the point you made, how the enemy comes like really to steal, to kill or to destroy. So it's almost like, your experience was a broken home and there was a subconscious fear that you know i never want my home to be broken like in your case your parents divorced and you're like i don't want to repeat that so you guys are strong there that that wouldn't happen but the enemy says listen you're afraid of a broken home let me try to take your wife mm. to let your kids experience the broken home yeah. that you're talking about right and so you have to stand up to that something you probably never expected Absolutely. that when you got married that you're gonna into your marriage seven years into your marriage be wondering if, if the person who you love so deeply and dearly is going gonna, is gonna to be there. And so at this point, uh, I'm assuming now, so you have a seven-year-old. So the seven-year-old was not born yet? or Well, the no, seven-year-old wasn't born yet. In fact, <clears throat> after this surgery, yeah. they said you'll never have kids again. Okay. We always felt we were going to have four kids. Okay. So we were at kid number three at this point. Okay. And two years into that, after kid number three, um, this is when everything broke down in her body. And so post the surgery um she was kind of relearning to walk a little My bit gosh, and different yeah. things and and they said you're never going to have kids again and even because of her background and history and and some sickness that she had had when she was a kid they told her from the beginning in grade five she would never have kids oh my. let alone four let alone oh. after a surgery have one more and so yeah. our youngest her name is harvest and yeah. it really is a prophetic picture of what our life looked like post my wife going through this. I mean, I still remember the day <clears throat> back when we were in our different building, um, you, you've been to that building, uh, when she came out of the hospital and she came onto the platform and you know, it was like pandemonium because not only did we have people around the world praying, we had our church uh -huh. on their face praying for my wife you know, and to see the miracle in front of them Wow. And now, I mean, my wife's a first degree black belt jiu-jitsu, yeah. first yeah. degree, uh, she's a black belt in kickboxing. She yeah. teaches this. I mean, her whole world is not only better than it was, it's like way better than it yeah. was. Yeah. And so, you know, we really truly came out on top. Yeah. No, I love that. You know, and that's the grace of God. And that's, that's the goodness of God that he steps into our lives in the midst of challenges, you know. Uh, perhaps, you know, someone's watching today, Sean, and, and they're in that situation where they come from a broken home. Uh, there's hope. I hope they're picking up on what you're saying. There's hope for them that if you let Jesus come into your life, no matter the situation, no matter your journey, if you have that moment where you say, hey, God, I'm willing to surrender. I'm willing to intersect my life with yours. Something will begin to change. And I love what you said. It's not overnight, though. No. It takes some work. Mm. It takes some people around your life. And then something begins to happen. And your life literally begins to change. And even if you're going through a challenge, maybe someone's married today and they're going through a struggle and they're facing that fear of possibly a broken home, maybe because of a tragedy, maybe because of a conflict in their relationship. You know, this is where you want Christ to step in. Yeah. You want God to get into that relationship. And we're hearing a lot of stories, Sean, of people calling in and writing in about how as they're listening to the podcast, God's presence is touching them wow. and God's spirit is touching them and, and changing their marriages it's just wow. incredible how how god can do that because he cares about relationship he cares about family he cares about having homes that have a legacy that generation after generation mm. the blessing of god continues in families mm. and and so uh, i know people are being encouraged by uh, what you're saying so tell me is there one last thing you like to say to people yeah um as actually you're, as you're talking i'm just feeling like this sense of i think the number one thing, I think one of the most important truths to remember as a married couple is don't live a life where you only reach out to people to invest in your marriage when you're in crisis. Wow. You, you don't just take your car to the mechanic after your engine blows. Yeah. 
You take your car for consistent oil changes. Yeah. You fill it up with gas. You fill up to change the fluids. You got to maintain your vehicle. Yeah. But for some reason in relationships, so many people only see counsel, counselors, wow. get mentors in their life when things are in crisis. That is the most dangerous place to live. Wow. If you only have somebody pouring into your life, in your health, encouraging you to be healthier when you're in crisis, man, you've just wow. wasted so many years. You could have avoided so many wow. years of crisis because you had somebody yeah. pouring into your life all yeah. the way through, yeah. educating you, yeah. helping you, yeah. guiding you, coaching you. You know, we have mentors in so many other areas of our lives, but how many people have mentors in their marriages? Yeah. And when they're, I see this in church all the time. People come to church when they're in crisis. Yeah. The most dangerous place to be is when you're doing good. Yeah. It's never when you're in crisis. Yeah. When you're in crisis, you, you you're only, you're you know you need help. Yeah. It's when you don't know you need help is That's when dangerous. you most need to be investing in yourself so you don't get to crisis. And so I would say this, I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are as a married couple. You are missing out on what could be because somehow you think you're just okay. Yeah. Being okay is the best friend of your enemy. My gosh. Being yeah. God's best is where he wants you to be. And I think so many of us forfeit our best on the altar of just okay. Right. I'm okay, everything's good, don't wanna stir the pot. Man, we need help, we need leaders, we need mentors, yeah. we need pastors, we need coaches in our corner in every area of our life, in yeah. our health, in our well being, in our fitness, in our our marriages and our relationships. I mean, yep. we need to apply it. And if we do that, I believe we will have a successful, long lasting version of the best form of relationship yeah. we can have. Yeah, I love that, Sean. That's amazing. That's great counsel actually, you know, and uh, for, for us to be able to know, we need that in our lives. Yeah. Like, let's not wait till we have a problem, mm. right? And uh, let's have that support today, have that community today. And also the relationship with God. That's where it starts. Absolutely. You yeah. know, you don't want a relationship with God in crisis only. Absolutely. You yeah. know, I'm in crisis now. I believe God, you exist or I need you. Start now yeah. and start maintaining that relationship and build a strong foundation with God in your relationship. Mm -hmm. And he'll also bring these kind of people around you. Right. Pay attention to who he's bringing into your life. Kind of like how we started our conversation today. God will bring people across your path mm -hmm. and connect you with people that will ultimately allow you to see God's best in your life. You know, I think that alone is hard for people to believe that it's possible mm -hmm. because we live in such a, a negative world, Yeah, you know, and you wonder, are there people out there that would have my best interest in their heart? And they are, because mm -hmm. there are people like that. And God does bring people like that in your life. And obviously that does make a tremendous difference and a tremendous change here. Yeah. So, so Sean, listen, man, it was great having you today. So man. good to be here. There's so you. many things I'm thinking we could kind of talk about and go all in all kinds of directions. And we've had some great times doing live television and media over the years, if you recall, and, and yeah. just crazy times as well. Fun yeah. times. Yes. Uh, with, you know, guests on set and uh, crazy things happening live on, on television. Next time, example. you know, our relationship started in a hot tub. Next podcast, in the hot tub. <laughs> well, there you go. In the right? hot tub. <laughs> yeah. Have a whole bunch of leaders over, a whole bunch of people over. Good, yeah. But uh, that would be really amazing. But yeah. thanks again, Sean, for sharing yeah. your heart. Really appreciate that. And it's just incredible having to hear your heart and your journey. And just want to say we love you and Michelle and the family. And so excited for you. And love to have you back sometime. Have some great conversation great. with you as well. And hey, you have your own podcast. I do. Supernatural. The Supernatural Leadership Podcast. Yes, awesome. You get so, it on all platforms. Yeah. yeah. Well, hey, we encourage you to check that out. By the way, we want to encourage you to like, subscribe, hit the bell so you can let people know about this, share what God's doing through this podcast. We'd love to hear from you as well. And we can't wait to see you next time.